I mean, do you think that she'll be a sympathetic, you know, witness because she got paid off for so little? Yeah, because of course, right, in hindsight, if she'd had, right, if she could see where things were going to be, yeah, she would have held up for much more. But I also think that, again, this is why she's relatable. Welcome to Law and Chaos. Today, we're joined by New York litigator Diana Florence, who spent 24 years as a prosecutor in the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. We'll discuss the upcoming Trump trial for creating false business records to hide the Stormy Daniels hush money payoff by disguising it as legal fees on the Trump Organization's books. After we recorded, events overtook us, and it looks like that trial will get pushed off for a few weeks. But the New York case is still the only one on track to go to trial before the election. We've got a lot to cover, so let's get after it. Hey guys, it's Liz Dye, and uh, we really have a good show for you today. We're going to break down Trump's false business records case in New York, which was set to go to trial on March 25th, as of Wednesday, when I recorded the interview with former prosecutor Diana Florence. But a filing Thursday afternoon has put that date in doubt. More on that in a second. Do not worry. We're just going to set the table first. Porn star Stormy Daniels claims that in 2006, she had a sexual encounter with Donald Trump at a golf tournament at Lake Tahoe. She was hoping to get herself booked on The Apprentice at the time. Now, that never happened. But 10 years later, when Donald Trump was running for president, she sought to monetize her brief uh, relationship with this guy whom everybody assumed would lose to Hillary Clinton. And she wasn't the only one looking to cash in. Luckily, for Trump anyway, he had a decades-long relationship with the CEO of the National Enquirer, a guy named David Pecker. Through the magazine, Pecker was running a catch-and-kill scheme to buy up stories that could be potentially damaging to Trump and his campaign and make sure that those stories never saw the light of day. So under the guise of buying her story for publication— Pecker paid $150,000 to a woman named Karen McDougal, who had had an affair with Trump in 2006. And then he did not publish the story, despite saying that she was going to get all these exclusives and she was going to be a big star. He also paid to kill a story that involved an alleged Trump love child. That, That appears to have been false. But Pecker got cold feet and backed out of buying the Daniel story, reportedly because his lawyers told him it would look like an illegal campaign contribution. So Michael Cohen, that's Trump's lawyer slash fixer slash bag man, fronted the $130,000 payment by drawing on his own home equity line. So that amounted to an undisclosed gift to the campaign, far in excess of the limit, which was somewhere like less than $3,000 in 2016. It's more than that now. Cohen later pled guilty to campaign finance and tax fraud, as well as to lying to Congress. But before that, he needed to get his money back from Trump, right? He wanted his $130,000. But Trump couldn't just like write him a $130,000 check with like porn star hush money payment in the memo line. So they had to get creative. Also, side note, Cohen claimed to have paid a tech dude from Liberty University $50,000 to rig an online poll in Trump's favor. Uh, That also was a campaign contribution that Trump couldn't easily expense, right? Because rigging an online poll isn't something that you want to admit to. And and Cohen had fronted the money. Or, well, in reality, Cohen gave the tech guy like $13,000 in cash and a single boxing glove, which he claimed had been worn by a famous fighter. But he still turned around and billed Trump for the full $50,000, obviously. So the parties agreed back in 2017, that they needed to double the $180,000, that's the 130 plus the 50, to account for the fact that Cohen was going to call it ordinary income, and he's presumably in the 50% tax bracket, right? So he needs $360,000 on his W-2 or whatever to net $180,000 after he pays off the IRS and the New York tax authorities. Plus, they gave him a $60,000 bonus, which, you know, $30,000 after taxes. Fine. So that works out to $420,000, right? The three sixty dollars plus the sixty. dollars Cohen bills this to Trump and the Trump organization in 12 tranches of $35,000 each, denominating them as retainer payments. 
Trump then wrote checks for $35,000 and then recorded the retainer payments in the company ledger as a business expense. And so each of these was three separate false business transactions, right? The invoice, the check, and the ledger notification. And that is how they got to 34 false business records charges, more or less, which does have a whiff of multiplying counts just to bulk up a crummy indictment. And, you know, there's been a lot of criticism of this indictment for being sort of pissant. Like, yes, you can frame them as felonies, and we'll talk about how those misdemeanor counts got to be plussed up to felonies with Diana Florence. But generally, false business records is not like your main charge. It's your, like, it's your add-on. I, I, when, when Diana and I prepped for the show, she talked about it as being like the fries. It's not the burger. And it's not going to result in a custodial sentence. Like, let's level set with expectations here. This is not something that you go to jail for. So even though this was the first indictment in New York and it came before the charges in D.C., Florida, and Georgia, most people are not super excited about this case. On the other hand, it increasingly looks like this is the only case that's going to go to trial before the election. Uh, Although, as I said big asterisk, because that that theory took a bit of a hit yesterday too, thanks to Trump and the U.S. Attorney's Office. Okay, here's the sequence of events according to the district attorney's motion. Last year, the DA asked the government, the U.S. Attorney, for all the Brady and Giglio material from the federal government. That's like exculpatory material that prosecutors have to turn over. It requested everything from the federal investigation relating to the hush money payout, including grand jury material, because remember, this case was originally investigated by special counsel Robert Mueller back in 2018. In June of 2023, the DA handed over everything it got from the U.S. attorney. And, you know, Trump didn't complain at the time. But seven months later, in January of 2024, Trump finally got around to subpoenaing the U.S. attorney for discovery materials, more stuff that he said he wanted, and he acceded to multiple delays in production, right? The government said, it's going to take us a little longer to, you know, comply with the subpoena. And Trump said, cool, no problem, more than once. So that meant that the production was pretty long delayed. So since March 4th of this year, that is, you know, like 10 days ago, the U.S. attorney produced an additional 104,000 pages of discovery materials with more to come next week. And now Trump wants a 90-day delay of the trial to deal with it. The government, that is the state of New York, the district attorney's office, is kind of pissed that this happened, but also it says that this is Trump's fault. Let's read a little bit from the notice that it filed with the court on Thursday afternoon. We note that the timing of the current production of additional materials from the U.S. Attorney's Office, the USAO, is a function of defendant's own delay. That is, it's Trump's fault. And then the the notice goes on to say the people diligently sought the full grand jury record related to Cohen's campaign finance convictions from the USAO last year, including exculpatory material. And then goes on to list a whole bunch of different categories of grand jury material, which it asked for and, you know, didn't get all of it, but got a lot. So it says, in response, the USAO produced a subset of the materials we requested, which we timely and fully disclosed to defendant on June 8th, 2023, more than nine months ago, right? So they said, we asked for everything. The feds gave us not everything, but a whole lot, and we turned over what we got. So we, that is the district attorney, did fine. Going on, despite having access to those materials since June, defendant raised no concerns to the people, that's the district attorney, about the sufficiency of our efforts to obtain materials from the USAO before last week. Instead, defendant waited until January 18th, 2024, to subpoena additional materials from the USAO and then consented to repeated extensions of the deadline for the USAO's determination. The timing of the USAO's production is a result solely of defendant's delay despite the people's diligence. Okay? So what they're saying is, we asked for all of it. We gave the defendant, we gave Trump what the feds gave us, and he didn't say there was anything wrong with it until January, a mere two months before the trial, when he flipped his shit and said that he was entitled to more. And then when the government said, oh, we're thinking about whether we're going to give this to you, he was like, cool, take your time, man. No problem. But still, it's kind of 
bad practice to go into a trial like five seconds after the defendant has been provided with the evidence. It's, you know, it's courting uh, like appeals. It's, it's giving the defendant a colorable basis for an appeal. So the prosecutor's like, yeah, we're not doing that. So the DA is now agreeing to a 30-day delay in the trial because, okay, it's not, it's not really reasonable to voice new evidence on the defendant 11 days before, before the trial. Even if it's the defendant's own fault, and even if there's like nothing new in the federal government's production, or at least that's what the prosecutors say. It's cleaner this way, and by agreeing to 30 days, they're probably going to stop Justice Juan Marchand from granting like 60 days or 90 days, which is what Trump asked for. So I expect that shortly after you hear this, Justice Marchand will agree to move the trial if schedule permitting. He has space, right? It is what it is. It's not a big deal. And I expect that this case will continue to be on the calendar and go to trial before the election, which, you know, it's the only one we got. And um, just, just one more note. This clearly gives the lie to Trump's constant claim that Biden is controlling all the prosecutions because if Merrick Garland was trying to get Trump, as Trump says, you know, every single damn day on Truth Social, the AG would not have allowed this production of evidence to drag out long enough to push back the trial in New York. So uh, I look for Trump and his minions to stop saying that obvious lie, eh, like never. Anyway, if you are a subscriber at patreon.com slash law and chaos pod or on Substack at uh, lawandchaospod.com, you're going to get to the interview right now. But for everyone else, we will see you in a minute after we pay some bills. And with me is Diana Florence, a litigator in New York who spent 25 years at the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, where she started the Construction Fraud Task Force. She's prosecuted dozens of false business records charges, and she's here to walk us through the case against Donald Trump, which will go to trial in less than two weeks. Diana, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Okay, so I already talked a little bit about the case in the introduction, but can you can you just explain for for our listeners the charges here and how they became, you know, they started out as misdemeanors, but now they're felonies. Sure. So the charges in this case are falsifying business records, and there's multiple of them. I believe there are 34 to be exact. Mm -hmm. And they are not 34. Uh, they are technically individual crimes, but this is really part of one scheme or plan. And so what they are, in essence, is when a person puts a false statement into the records of, an, of a business. That's literally what it is. And that, mm -hmm. that act alone of something false that's written or recorded in, in the records of a business, that is a misdemeanor in New York State. And in the federal system, it's a, sort of akin to wire fraud. Um, that's kind of its partner on the federal side. And mm -hmm. various states have different um, versions of falsifying business records. Where you elevate it, though, from an A misdemeanor, which is the most serious type of misdemeanor, to the lowest level felony, an E felony, is when, when you make those falsifications uh, with intent to commit another crime. Mm -hmm. So that could be virtually anything. It doesn't have to be another felony. It just has to be another crime. And so what happens here is that the the prosecution, they don't have to name what the other crime is in the pleadings or the indictment, but they do have to have a theory of that. And they will have to prove what the the other crime, the intent to commit the other crime was. And, and, and to be clear about that also, you don't have to prove the other crime happened. It's just the intent to commit that other crime. Right. Um, so in this particular case, DA Bragg, uh, through um, I, both uh, court pleadings and also I think in the press, has has expressed that it's a combination of election uh, election violations, a federal election um, law, and also mm -hmm. a state one. The federal one was a little bit murky because there's always questions of preemption, and I won't bore our listeners <laughs> with what that means because that's just you know that's in, in case they want to go to sleep later, then we could do a separate. Uh, <laughs> Material. No, no, no. I think people care about that. I, I think people do. I mean, to the extent that it's boring. Uh, yes, I, I agree that it, it isn't the most, you know, fascinating topic. But I think it, it's relevant because 
so many lawyers, uh, commentators have said, yeah, these are the weakest set of charges. These are kind of these are kind of pissant charges. These these 34 business records like they're not sexy like the Rico in Georgia, although they have not fallen apart visibly like the Rico in Georgia. So so that's something. But I mean, I I think I guess I, th- I think it makes sense to say that what what happened here, the way that these got to be 34 felonies and not 34 misdemeanors, was that they were committed in 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 assistance of another crime. And so that plus them up. Yes, exactly. So it's two things. It's interesting because they are, of course, falsifying business records are less serious than, uh, you know, RICO. And, and in New York, we have something called enterprise corruption, which is the state version of RICO. Mm-hmm. Um, but to be clear, what RICO really is, is alleging that someone is is running a criminal enterprise. So, you know, they are a mafia boss, if you will. But mm-hmm. the way you, but, but just the ver- virtue of using Tony Soprano, just the fact that Tony Soprano was a waste management consultant would not convict him of RICO. The way that you would convict him of RICO is you would have to show the pattern acts, or, or which means crimes. So right. it could be murder for hire, but it could also be falsifying the ledger of the Bada Bing Club to suggest that the money that he got for you know payoffs were you know uh, from the you know from liquor sales. So uh-huh. that's what's for, sort of funny about falsifying business records. Not the sexiest, not the most interesting, and certainly on their own, they're not. You're not going to go away for life in prison for falsifying business records, but they're quietly serious. Right, and you've you've prosecuted a lot of these charges. Yes, and that's because when you prosecute anything in the white collar world. And I spent most of my career, 20 years of it, doing white collar kind of crime, you know, uh, crime prosecutions in New York. You start with falsifying uh, business records or the the sort of partner um, is what if they falsify uh, documents to the government. So Mm -hmm. that's a a different crime, but it, it doesn't matter for our purposes. But those document crimes are usually where the investigations start. What's really unusual about this particular indictment is that's also where they ended. Um, so that's kind of interesting to me. Right. I mean, I think this isn't where anybody wanted to end, right? Because you, as you know, I mean, you probably can't discuss it because you were in the office, but Cyrus Vance, uh, Alvin Bragg's predecessor, investigated this for a long, long time and, and even went to the Supreme Court to get Trump's business records. I don't think that they wanted to end up here, but they they are here now. I mean, Trump has complained that they're here now for only political reasons, that, that they waited this long to prosecute him because they waited for him to be, you know, declare himself for president. I don't think that that's exactly right. Do you think that's right? No, that doesn't sound right to me because, frankly, like you say, I mean, they went to the Supreme Court. That took about two years at least. Right. And and you could argue, because this is kind of um, turning Trump's argument on himself, that they waited till he wasn't president uh, to bring the charges. And, you know, so that's also a factor here. So I don't think that there's there, there's no look, there's a statute of limitations in in every state. For, uh, for most crimes, including falsifying business records. And if mm-hmm. they waited too long, this would have been, you know, this would have been uh, out of statute. So th- they were within their rights to bring it when they brought it. Yeah. I mean, as someone who covers Trump for my, that is my job, you know, to cover Trump's <laughs> litigation, I think it's kind of chutzpah for him to say, well, you guys waited so long to charge, right? The the issue in Vance was that Trump said, not only could I, could he as the sitting president not be charged with crimes, he couldn't even be investigated with crimes. And the Supreme Court said, no, that's not how this goes. And then Trump has kind of argued about it and fought against every piece of process in this. And the, you know, look, the AG's case that just wrapped up, Trump fought the subpoenas for forever, fought the subpoenas for for years and fought compliance for years and in, indeed got himself sanctioned. So and, and and he's fought everything. Like in the in the Florida documents case, he you know he contested the warrant and screwed around for months and months with Judge Eileen Cannon. So for him to say you guys timed this, well, everybody would have liked to charge a year ago. Trump mm-hmm. Trump just fought everything. But okay, so tell me how you think this case is is going to go when we get to court, right? I mean, what's what's going to happen in two weeks? 
So what's going to happen is there has been some preliminary pretrial motions that will be decided. Uh, and we can go into those a little later. We can do those now, Love but that. those are usually, yep. Uh, but they're, you know, and they, but they're very directly uh, relevant to what the defense can do and what the prosecution can do in their case in chief. So, well, let's talk about them now then. Okay. So the judge is going to need to resolve those before anything else uh, can happen. Mm-hmm. Okay. So there, there are two motions and they're actually, I found them to be very funny. Um, the first was a motion for presidential immunity. And I get, I, I get why he would like to try this because it worked in DC, right. For him to say, I'm, I'm immune for my official acts as president, but I don't, I don't think it works as well here. No, I mean, it, it, it doesn't. He, I mean, first off the underlying conduct, which, which sort of created the, the sort of circumstances of the false filings, are pre-presidential. So mm-hmm. I, I just, on no, on no planet can I see any court somehow deeming this part of an official act, which would have to kind of pre, you know, that would have to be the, the precursor to immunity, I would think, to the, to the extent there exists immunity at all. So this, and these are state charges and, you know, it's also kind of murky and not, and not, you know, clear why, um, a, 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 a president. They're not, we don't have kings here. I mean, that was sort of right. the reason we have the constitution. So I'm not sure how a federal uh, courts saying a president has immunity would then preclude him from being prosecuted for crimes that happened related to conduct before he was president. So I don't, I mean, this is, a, this is such a hard thing to kind of logically piece out because mm-hmm. it's so out of, like out out of the realm of anyone or anything I've ever heard of. (laughs) Right. But he wants him. Look, I think we both know and he knows he's not going to get this case tossed for immunity. But he asked he asked for something else. He asked to get evidence tossed on on immunity grounds. Right. 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 And so the judge is going to have to rule on that as well. And I think some part of that was, um, I think, believe tweets and different Mm -hmm. social media. Um, And that's also. I mean, that would be unprecedented because, look, certainly there is a very robust um, sort of case law around Miranda and, you know, compelled statements. But the the key thing there is those are under interrogation by a government. If you decide to go on social media, you know, either before or during or after crimes are committed, that's at your own peril. And that would that's literally, you know, I don't see how. He could preclude those things. I mean, these are they they can make inferences. It's for the the Mm -hmm. jury to make inferences. The defense certainly can, you know, rebut them and say that's not what he meant or that's not what this means or this was all in jest or whatever. But um, especially the more social media there is, the harder it is to kind of, you know, kind of parse it out. And we do know that, you know, Mr. Trump likes to like likes likes his uh, social media. Yeah. If I understand his argument, he's saying. I cannot be prosecuted for my official acts and tweeting, uh, you know, shit posting as he did every day in the White House is, a, is an official act. And thus the official act cannot be used as evidence. And those, you know, I, I can see how like I can see how that makes a superficial, a highly superficial sense. But the official act is not what he's being prosecuted for. The official act, even if you assume that the tweeting is an official act is evidence, right? There's no there's no bar on using evidence of official no. acts. There's only a bar on prosecuting official acts, right? That's right. I mean, and if anything, you know, I would argue that it could be consciousness of guilt, right? So certain things, you know, that he's um, putting in, so they actually would be exceptions for, exceptions to hearsay, exceptions, you know, there's a million ways to argue this. I mean, it's just very, the whole thing is very, very strange because, presidential immunity in and I mean, again, what other president, we have no one to compare this to, right? right? No one has ever gotten here. Bill Clinton didn't want to talk about, you know, didn't want to be deposed in the Paula Jones lawsuit and didn't want to, you know, be deposed by Ken Starr. But nobody has done this. Nobody has said like stuff that I did, you know, in my personal capacity to cover up a, you know, a hush money payment is is somehow an official, official act. It it is, it. I mean, it is chutzpah. I don't, I don't know. I mean, if you you, look, you you've practiced inside that office and you've practiced outside that office. Do you think as a lawyer, what's the end game of filing such a fakakta motion? 
<laughs> uh, the end game is to preserve on appeal, number one, and number two, to satisfy your client. <laughs> they have two yeah. they have two audiences. And then maybe number three in this case is to satisfy uh, the, you know, the MAGA constituency. Yeah, yeah. I mean, oh, can I just double back? Because I think there was something, you touched on something really interesting there, which is why they want to get the tweets in, that the district attorney has said in a motion in limine that the tweets are evidence of his kind of consciousness of guilt because he said things on Twitter like, I sure hope that Michael Michael Cohen doesn't lie and, you know, flip on me because that would be ridiculous. And he said other things like, you know, flipping is bad and it should never be allowed and it's like the worst thing in the world. I mean, he has all of these tweets where he talks like a gangster right around the time when Michael Cohen was going to flip on him and, and give him up to Robert Mueller um, during the Mueller investigation in 2018. So as a prosecutor, what would you do with, with that kind of stuff? Well, I mean, I think that you want to defeat defenses. when you're, So when you're putting on your direct case, you are, number one, telling a story. And when you have – and you use your evidence. You know, I always used to joke that um, I'm, I'm a – my former life, I went to college on a music scholarship and then dropped it immediately when I realized my my talent was limited. But I Me mean, too. my friend- <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to talk about that later. But the, so I think, well, I think, you know, there's a little bit of a, you know, art, you know, lawyers as artists. And I think uh-huh. that the, you know, I think that's important. And, and this sounds a little out there. But what I guess what I'm saying is that you use, you know, you, your your canvas is the trial. And, and essentially you are going to use, you're going to create this case in chief using instead of, you know, you know, marble or paint, you're going to use evidence. And so to Mm -hmm. me, every piece of evidence is a mosaic that will, will, will help, you know, sort of um, illustrate your case. So the, and that's why the the most powerful cases are not going to be based on one cooperating witness or one, you know, one set of emails Mm -hmm. or even one set of ledgers. I mean, this could be the most boring case ever if you just say, well, here are the ledgers that say legal fees and we know they're not legal fees case, you know, we, 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 we rest. Nobody will care. Nobody will, uh, they may not convict because they'll be like, why did we, what, what does this matter? What you have to do in this case is make this matter. And so I know there's a long way from answering your question. I'll get right there. So which is those, <laughs> those yeah. tweets are going to be part of really humanizing and sort of explaining to those jurors. And Manhattan juries, you know, are going are smart and they live in a city that's every day you have to be, you have to put on your suit of armor to get around and, 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 and survive. So Mm -hmm. they are, they are skeptical, you know, they have their, and they're going to want to know why, you know, even though the jury, the prosecutor doesn't have to prove it, they're not just going to be like, oh yeah, their lies will, you know, let's go home. They're going to want to say, okay, what is the story here? So the Mm -hmm. tweets, are going to be part and parcel of explaining why someone who is such a, you know, larger than life figure who really had it all, he's, you know, born wealthy, you know, names, his name is on the skyline, is the president of the United States, all these things, why would he get himself into this rut? And that's what people are going to want to know. And that's the tweets are part of that. Got it. And you know, he looked kind of guilty in those tweets, like as a non-practicing, I mean, I'm a lawyer, but as a non-practicing lawyer, he looks really guilty in all of those tweets, right? So I I definitely see why he wants them to get in. But also what you're saying about a story, I think that this is a pretty good story. I mean, it's a very interesting, it's tawdry, it's, you know, but it's got, it's got some interesting characters. I mean, Michael Cohen is flawed. Let's say he's flawed. (laughs) Uh, He's, well, he's no longer a lawyer. I mean, look, he's got this long history with Trump where he, you know, he flipped on Trump and Trump immediately sued him for five hundred million dollars. And they have this whole back and forth. But he also was convicted of lying to Congress and convicted of other things. So do you think that he's going to make a good witness? I think that he'll be a fine witness, but I think that anyone who is, you know, halfway logical or rational is going to be very skeptical of every word out of his mouth. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think that, you know, he's went from being Trump's biggest defender to now his biggest antagonizer. And that always is suspicious, right? So Mm -hmm. you always have to listen to, you're going to listen to him. Doesn't mean he can't he can't tell the truth, but you have to start with, okay, 
he's saying this. Now, what kind of things, um, even if the law didn't require you to corroborate what he's saying, um, if I'm a juror, and certainly if I'm a prosecutor, I want to corroborate it many more than just one time. I want to do as much corroboration as possible. But that being said, just because he's not someone that you would want to sit down and, and you know, have dinner with, or maybe you would because he's kind of, you know, he's certainly interesting, but he's not a person, <laughs> that you'd want, maybe you'd, not someone that you'd want dating one of your kids, right? You wouldn't want yeah, that type sure. of person. <laughs> but you, at the same token, you, it doesn't mean that he w- doesn't have um, good evidence to give and that he necessarily is telling falsehoods. He needs to be corroborated. Right. I mean, he did, he did more or less get caught lying on the witness stand in the AG case, you know, a couple of months ago. So that, that was not great for his, his credibility, but look, nobody in this case is, I mean, nobody in this case is an absolutely ideal witness. We're Talking about, you know, Alan Weisselberg, Trump's uh, longtime CFO, theoretically retired, who just got convicted of perjury. He's he's a major fact witness in this case as well. Yeah. I mean, I think the reason that and it kind of goes back to the beginning of our, our conversation, the reason that you go with document evidence is and document cases is because at the end of the day, the documents don't lie. The documents are fairly, they're, they're concrete, they're square. <laughs> um, they say what they say. Yes. The, the witnesses are going to give, you know, co- context to them, but again, you know, it's going to be, you can take as jurors, you can listen to this rogues gallery, if you will, of the, the controller and the former lawyer and the former, you know, adult uh, film star, but together, taken with the the papers, I think that it tells a story. And to me, that's how you're going. Because if you just did, I don't think you can. But even if you just tried to make it, a, you know, having a, a custodian of records from the Trump organization, entering them into evidence, and then someone else, uh, an investigator entering Michael Cohen's records into evidence, showing that they weren't really legal fees, that there's no proof that he did any legal work. That's mm-hmm. a boring case. And I, d- I think it would not end up in a conviction. If you give the whole reason for why this happened, you know, starting with, you know, Stormy Daniels story and then the Access Hollywood, t- you know, tapes, what happened there and the election and then afterwards. Now you have an interesting story that anyone would be interested in, in hearing. And then you understand why in the end of the day it ends up in this in these false false documents. Yeah. So Stormy Daniels has said she is going to testify. Do you think that she'll be a good witness? I actually think she's going to probably, certainly of those three, she will be the best witness, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think she has an interesting story to tell. And I think she's, you know, having seen interviews with her, she's, she's in, you know, this is going to sound strange, but she's somewhat relatable. Um, She's a single mom. And she was, you know, and, and there's, you know, sort of there's some sympathy to the fact that she was trying to get on The Apprentice and that she, you know, sort of got herself um, entangled with Mr. Trump. And, you know, even putting aside, like, I don't think it really matters um, this, the, you know, whether they had a sexual relationship or not. I, I expect that if if they're putting her on and, and if I were prosecuting this, she would be my first witness. It would oh, be yeah. an open-ended question and say, you know, directing your attention to whatever date in 2008, you know, at the golf club, you know, can you tell us what happened? And then give her the ability to do a narrative. I, the point is not whether or not they had sexual relations. The The point is that that there would have been an appearance that they had, even if they didn't. Mm-hmm. And that sort of propels the, you know, the National Enquirer and the catch and kill and, and the fact that, you know, um, was it Pecker that he was not going to pay a second catch and kill fee and, then, and why this kind of unraveled. That's an interesting story. And it starts with her, I think. Right. And Pecker is going to be a witness. I mean, just just to remind everybody, uh, David Pecker was the CEO of uh, I can't remember. It's like American Media International. It's AMI is the parent company of the National Enquirer. And he did pay for the first story. He paid to keep Karen McDougal quiet. She was a former Playboy model who had a relationship with Trump. He paid to buy her story for some de minimis amount of money, some offensively low amount of money like maybe $35,000 or something. But he induced her saying that he was going to kind of put her in other AMI publications. And then, you know, she wound up talking to, to Ronan Farrow. 
But for the second, interestingly, as I recollect it, he, David Pecker, originally committed to buy Stormy Daniels' story in the same way, but then backed out because his counsel told him that it was going to be a campaign finance violation. And, yes. and, and, and indeed, Michael Cohen did eventually plead to a campaign finance violation you know, in conjunction with a hundred and thirty thousand dollar payout, because it was an illegal contribution to the Trump campaign, it was a non non declared, you know, hundred and thirty thousand dollar gift to the campaign, essentially, because then she didn't go and tell her story. And you know, looping back to Stormy Daniels, a hundred and thirty thousand dollars is a lot of money, but it's also not a lot of money considering that he kept her quiet and you know pro might not have gotten to the White House if if he hadn't. I mean, do you think that she'll be a sympathetic, you know, witness because she got paid off for so little. Yeah, because of course, right in hindsight, if she'd had right, if she could see where things were going to be, yeah, she would have held up for much more. But I also think that again, this is why she's relatable. The people on the jury are going to be from all walks of life. A typical Manhattan mm -hmm. jury could have a you know Park Avenue you know multi-millionaire and a bus driver and a you know recent high school graduate who works at Starbucks and a lawyer and account like you have literally every walk of life but mm -hmm. most of those people would save the Park Avenue you know billionaire most of those people $130,000 is a lot of money and could really and, and could help a lot and in that you know and and to you know through the opportunity cost the idea that they, they would the thing would be over i think most people regular people think that's a lot of money and would um, would understand and i think that that's important because trump's you know kind of aim is going to you know i think the default would be to kind of what has been done to women through you know throughout the ages, right? Sort of, you know, um, say she's a liar, she's a, you know, opportunist and all those things. But the reality is, if that's the case, then why did they pay her off, right? I mean, if she, I mean, if, and I think that will, and if he goes there, I think the prosecution wins. So the funny thing is, the smarter play would be to probably not go into whether or not they actually had sex or not. And I think just to take, I would, I would really just take her at sort of face value because like she has no idea what they wrote down in the re in the records. And remember, we have mm -hmm. to re keep in mind what the charges are, right? She doesn't know whether there were legal fees or where the money came from. All she knows is that she got the money. And I mm -hmm. would, if I were the Trump lawyers, I would not be, you know, skewering her. I would let her tell her story in object if she tries to get too into the weeds or, you know, tries to evoke too much sympathy, get her on and off. Because to me, the ones that are much easier and much more dangerous for Mr. Trump are Cohen and Wesselberg because they are actually going to testify to the actual crime. Yeah. And you know what? Let's talk about that other motion that Trump filed before we talk about their testimony, because I think it's going to be dispositive in some ways. Do you want to talk about what the advice of counsel is and, and maybe isn't, according to Trump's motion? <laughs> well, I mean, I, as best that I could follow, um, they... Advice of counsel is a defense that essentially says, you know, in general, not now in his motion, but is that I committed these acts, but I did it because my lawyer said it was OK. That's basically mm -hmm. what it is. But in order to do that and, and in the state court, by the way, there really is not an advice of counsel um, defense uh, per se. It's really more of a federal defense. Uh, it really is very rarely used in, in state court, but to the extent that you could use it because it goes to intent. Right. Yeah. At the end of the day, this is an intent crime. You intentionally falsified business records, right? If you made a mistake, if I sign my name um, instead of Diana Florence, I wrote Diane Florence, right? And, and, mm -hmm. and you charge me with false filing, you know, come on, right? Mm -hmm. That's a fault, you know, that's the, maybe my hand slipped or something. You know, that's mm -hmm. not, I didn't mm -hmm. intend to falsify. So because there's intent here, that's where the advice of counsel would come in. But the thing that's really sort of interesting here is that, in order to assert an advice of counsel defense, whether in state or federal court, you have to disclose what your lawyer told you. That's and that's privilege normally. Right. And what's kind of insane about the motion that that I saw and and you know you also had some in opinions. We we had a conversation about it. It, it basically they don't want to waive privilege. So I'm right. not sure how, you know, are they going to call the lawyer? Are they talking about Michael Cohen? 
Um, I don't know. (laughs) As I read that motion, Trump was saying, I don't want to do advice of counsel where I say my lawyer said I should do it. And so I did. What he wants to say was, well, there were a lot of lawyers involved in this deal. And that gave me the reasonable impression that it was kosher. And I don't know that Justice Mershon is going to let them do. I mean, that's basically having your cake and eating it, too. That's that's Trump asserting an advice of counsel defense but not waiving the privilege, which would prove that he did it. He he seems to say that he's going to do this by getting Pecker and Cohen to testify as to Trump's subjective state of mind on the witness yes. stand. And I, I mean, you're a prosecutor. That seems that seems kind of convoluted. No, you you definitely can't have other people testify of what you intended to do. Um, no, that's. Yeah, that doesn't make a lot of sense. And the fact that lawyers were involved, well, one of the lawyers is sitting there with how many convictions, right? Federal Mm -hmm. convictions, Cohen. And, you know, the, that, that absolutely, it's an interesting way to frame it. It's not an advice of counsel defense. If you were going to do one such that it exists, again, to defeat your intent, then you would have to prove that the, what your, the advice was (laughs) and that you acted on it. Right, right. You can't say a lawyer prepared this document and I assumed that the lawyer, you know, that a lawyer would not prepare a bad document. And thus, it was. I don't have intent to. I mean, that's that's clearly what he's going to say. Do you think Justice Mershon is going to let him do that? Isn't that kind of an end run around the privilege waiver inherent to an advice of counsel defense? I, I definitely do not. I mean, look, I, I, I'm not, uh, you know, judge, I'm not in the, the, the mind of the judge, but I definitely think that would be a very unusual ruling. I think that the, again, this is another motion that goes under the heading of preserving for appeal any, any possible issue that could bounce it back to the trial court. I don't see that there would be an appellate issue on this, but you know, you never know. So what do you think is going to happen with that advice of counsel motion? I mean, if you were the prosecutor, you wouldn't accept that, would you? No, no, of course not. I mean, look, I think what I would say was if if Trump wants to get on the stand and say I relied on lawyers, then he can say that. And I have no problem. You know, and, and, and but I'm also going to need to, you know, if he's going to put that forward, he's opening the door for me to explore what exactly he relied on. I mean, you can't just say relied on lawyers. Advice of counsel is actual advice and it has to be based on conversations. And I need to see the full. And I'd also want to, you know, want to know which lawyers. It can't just be general amorphous lawyers. It has to be, is it, is it Cohen? Is it um, Alina? You know, whatever. Is it Takapina? Right. Is it, who? I mean, Trump has been through a lot of lawyers. Right, right. I mean, these are lawyers who were in his orbit in 2018 and 2017 when he, you know, when, when he, when he made the, well, it was 2017 when he, he made the payments. I mean, it's, it's Michael Cohen. I don't, know that there were that many other lawyers involved in this deal that, you know, it was a hush money payment because he didn't want anybody to know about it. And the way you make sure nobody knows about it is for nobody to know about it. Mm-hmm. Although, I, you know, I, I, like, I say that and I think there were lawyers at the campaign who did know about it. So he's not going to make the traditional advice of counsel defense. What he wants to do is have his lawyers get up there and say, our client relied. And so, I mean, obviating the need for Trump to get on the witness stand and say it himself. I don't, I don't think that he's going to be able to like thread that needle. Do you think the court will let him thread that needle? No, I mean, you can't do that. You can't say, I mean, the only way I suppose that they could do that is if you called, well, let's put aside Michael Cohen, because we know he's, so they can cross-examine him on that, sure. But let's assume that there's other lawyers, right? I mean, John Smith lawyer that, that, that worked for him at some point between 2008 and 2016. Oh, I figured out who it is. It's Jared Kushner, because Jared Kushner is actually a lawyer. That's right. He is a lawyer. That's true. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, they could call, I mean, the defense could call that lawyer and say, did you give, you know, Trump advice about it? But again, he could say I gave advice, but if he says, what was that advice? That's privileged. And that's, and and if, if Trump is not waiving it, 
I'm just not, yeah, you can't argue, remember the, the, the tricky part of being a, a, a litigator is that you are not a witness. You can't, you know, as much as it's so amazing when we watch Law and Order and they get up there and I go, I know he raped her. You can't do that. You can't testify. You can't assert it. If the, his attorneys are going to say, Mr. Trump relied on, on, on the advice of counsel, then somebody is going to have to assert that either Trump or the lawyer who, who said it, and they have to waive privilege in order for them to testify. Right. I mean, look, Trump's lawyers on this one, with all due respect to Alina Haba, uh, every bit that she's due, every single iota of respect that I owe her, I am giving her now. She's not the lawyer on this one, right? She was the lawyer on the civil case and she was the lawyer on the E. Jean Carroll cases and neither one of those came out too well. But this is different, right? This is this is Todd Blanche and Emile Bove, um, both of them very seasoned. And I, I mean, I still think that this these filings were kind of garbage. But these are not crappy lawyers. These are these are good lawyers. Um, I, I they, they appear to be doing everything that they can do to piss off Justice Marchand before the trial even starts. But I mean, they're no Alina. Yeah, no. And, and that's right. And also Susan Necklace, I think, is also part of it. And she's right. very experienced. I, I yes. think that the reality is that the these lawyers are litigating you know, you're, sup- you're supposed to be when you litigate, number, rule number one is, you know, sort of you, you tailor your arguments to your audience. So if it's for the judge, then it's to the judge. If it's for the jury, it's for the jury. Um, I do think here that um, just by virtue of who the defendant is, that the lawyers are, you know, maybe certainly I would imagine not by choice, but they have to, they, they file these motions knowing full well they are going to go all over um, the world. And so that they are litigating not only to Judge Mershon, but also to you know, the Trump's constituency mm-hmm. um, and Trump himself, frankly, if he wants this done, he's doing that. And I think that I don't have a sense whether these lawyers have a good uh, ability to you know, basically say to him, don't do this. This is not a good move. They might, you know, I would imagine they thought this was a good move. Um, sometimes you can basically convince, I think Takapina, for example, I think he had a little better handle on that and sort of, you know, like, hey, you're not helping the case if you do that. Right. So Joseph Takapina was the lawyer in the first E. Jean Carroll case, and he successfully kept Trump out of court because Trump's behavior in court was so egregious that I think that Eugene Carroll's lawyer said, you know, that she heard Trump storming out during her uh, closing argument. And she's like, oh, there just went another $10 million on that on that jury award because Trump was so obnoxious. And in fact, the I believe it's Rolling Stone reported this week that Trump's lawyers are trying to nudge him not to testify in this case, or at least not to behave in such an aggressively obnoxious way in front of the jury, but that he's not super receptive. I mean, would you put him on the stand? (laughs) No, (laughs) definitely not. I think that would be a big mistake for Mr. Trump. Well, first off, I think that if he opens himself up to massive cross examination and, 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 you know, this story is so salacious and uh, it opens up uh, all of the tweets, um, he can be confronted with, I mean, there's just, it's almost would be impossible to prepare him taking aside. Let's pretend we don't know his Trump's personality it just having the volume of um, external statements for the last how many years, right? Going back, the, the cross examination, it would be days of of just going over his social media and and sort of and and the way he, you know, things that he said in in different contexts. You could literally find all the things that would you know anything that's relevant to the hush money. And there was so much press and so much attention even before. The election. So I think number one, it's that now now take into consideration that Trump, you know, definitely thinks he's the smartest guy in the room. I think that he will, you know, alienate a lot of jurors. So I don't think that uh, any and especially I, you know, I do know um, have been practiced against some of the lawyers that he's hired. It w- I can't imagine it would be their druthers to put him on the stand. I think they're smart enough to want to keep him off. Right. I mean, look, just as a as a an example, he's publicly told several different versions of this story. Right. He first he said he didn't know this woman. He'd never whatever. He'd never paid her. And then he said he was paying Cohen 
for legal work. And then Rudy Giuliani got on television and said, no, he was paying her for the hush money. It wasn't legal work at all. And then when he tried to get the case removed to federal court after Bragg charged him in 2023, I believe, he made an argument that Cohen was doing actual legal work unrelated to Stormy Daniels. And that was <laughs> patently false. But there's been a whole bunch of versions of this story out there. And if he gets on the witness stand, they're going to say, well, were you lying this day, you know, are you lying this day? Like these three things, only one of them can be true at, at most. And I maybe think none of them are true, but only one at most can be true. And you've told three versions of the story. Why should we believe you today? I mean, he's, you know, you're right. He's going to open himself up to all of that crazy stuff. Yeah. And the only other thing I'll say is that in generally speaking, something to remember, you know, unlike the AG's case or the E. Jean Carroll, those are civil cases. And in criminal cases, the burden is solely on the prosecution. And so I, I, I've i never kept track of this, but I, I mean, if I had to just sort of offhand when defendants have testified at my trials, I, maybe it's not 100% conviction rate, but 90 something percent. It's almost always goes poorly because, you know, you, they, they get themselves into too much trouble. So I don't think that Trump would do, there would be no reason, it would help the prosecution if anything, um, mm -hmm. and, and, I, and, and much better to be quiet. And they, and there's no inference that the jury uh, can take, um, if for him being quiet, that's his right as a, as a criminal defendant to remain silent. Right. And I think in the main, he's, especially with respect to New York said like, I can't get a fair trial here. So I have to like, you know, skip out on these New York jurors or he blamed, he blamed the courts for not, you know, justice and Goron and, and judge Lewis Kaplan for failing, you know, for saying, for circumscribing his potential testimony. And so he said like, well, I'm not doing this because I'm not going to be allowed to say anything. And then he, then of course he blamed Joseph Takapina and said, well, the first trial was so, you know, went badly for me and was, had negative effects in the second E. Jean Carroll trial because it was already, the jury having already found him that he had sexually assaulted E. Jean Carroll and then defamed her, that was the law of the case in the second trial. And I think Trump's theory was that had he been allowed to testify in the first trial, he would have persuaded the jurors with his manly charisma that he had <laughs> not raped and defamed uh, the, the plaintiff. And thus he wouldn't have been screwed for the purposes of the second trial by having all of that be the law of the case. I, I hesitate to you know agree with that since I don't find Trump particularly charming and I don't think New York jurors do either. But can I ask you a question about this advice of counsel defense? Because I'm so interested in how it would work if he were going to waive. I mean, look, the lawyer here, the main lawyer was Michael Cohen. Michael Cohen is he's not going to have any kind of confidences that he's holding. He's not he's not holding any attorney client privilege or Trump anymore. He's already he's going to he's testified about all of his dealings. And, and he's also pled guilty in conjunction with the same thing. So even if he weren't willing to testify, there's a crime fraud exception theory here. Right. But assuming if Trump were going to waive it, what would be different if it was waived? I mean, it's hard to know. I mean, one of the things that sort of, you know, flitted across my mind as you were speaking is David Pecker, remember you mentioned that he didn't want to pay the hush money in part because it would be a campaign, right? And that was what he was mm -hmm. advised by his counsel. Mm -hmm. So I suppose that the defense for Trump is that would not be a legal way to do this. So here's a legal way to do this. So that's that. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that um, Pecker was aware that they were going to do it a different way <laughs> and that his lawyer maybe, uh, even though it's not Trump's lawyer, that his lawyer was aware that they were going to do it this way, that somehow that's advice of counsel. I mean, it's very hard to understand because in a normal advice of counsel, again, it would the way it would work would be you would say, I, you know, I transferred the money to, you know, Switzerland because my my attorney said that this was a legal way to, you know, transfer money or something like mm -hmm. that. Right. And and if I'd known, right, if I if I'd known that my lawyer was a terrible lawyer and didn't know the law, I wouldn't have done it. Like that's essentially what he's saying. But I don't see how he can even if Trump gets on the stand and says that. 
there's so much, first of all, that they can cross-examine him with, namely even those tweets that we talked about at the beginning, right? But also, you know, you would then, you would put back on witnesses, you know, you put Michael Cohen back and you put different witnesses back on to to rebut that. Remember, the, the prosecution goes first, they put their ch- case in chief on, and then the defense can put on a case. They don't have to put on any case at all, but if they put Trump on the stand, the prosecutor not only gets to cross-examine, but then on rebuttal can now put on all sorts of witnesses that maybe Judge Mershon will say, you couldn't have gone this far. We're gonna, I'm only going to let you talk about the tweets from 2017 forward or something. And now he says, wait a minute, no, you can go back because he's opened the door. Okay, let me ask another question because – as I recollect, Michael Cohen recorded some conversations. I'm not sure if they were related to the Stormy Daniels payoff, but they were related, I think, to the McDougal payoff. He recorded mm-hmm. conversations with Weisselberg talking about, I think, setting up essential consultants to get, which was the, you know, the generically named LLC that he moved this money around mm-hmm. through uh, the $130,000, laundered the $130,000 payment to Stormy Daniels through. If you don't waive privilege, can that stuff come in? And how how can it come in? Well, Trump doesn't have when you have privilege with an attorney, and I'm not a privilege expert, but the you know, as best as I understand as a practicing lawyer, right? If you retain me as your lawyer, what we discuss is privileged, right? But if I talk to your husband, that's not privileged, right? Mm -hmm. If I talk Mm -hmm. to your business partner, it could be privileged if I'm working on a corporate thing. But again, there could be a crime if there's, this is a crime fraud exception, possibly if this is a c- criminal conspiracy. It's a little bit murky. So I'm not sure in and, in and of itself, I don't see that, that the Wesselberg-Michael Cohen conversation is privileged. Um, there right. would have to be a, a, a basis for, ex- and I'm not, and just with the, what I know, it doesn't sound privileged to me. Second off, I just think that, you know, the LLC, you know, whatever, if, if it was being formed, I mean, you know, remember it's, the recording is great because it's a contemporaneous statement. And it, again, mm-hmm. remember corroboration of Cohen, because we, we start out saying Cohen is a slug and we don't believe him. Anything that can corroborate what he's saying help, li- lifts him from slug to maybe, you know, worm, you know, whatever, you know, <laughs> it, you know it, lifts, it lifts him up. I'm, I'm, I'm picturing lowly worm from, uh, you know, Richard's scary book. So it's like yeah, you, you, exactly. you, get, you lift up the credibility and he's still pretty low, but then you think about it, like, then you, then you sort of logically ask questions like, well, what else was this LLC? If it's, if it's, you know, what else would this LLC before? Has it been used mm-hmm. since? Like, have, you know, is there any, has it bought any things? And it's that kind of stuff. It's, it's, you know, the conversation, putting aside the, the privilege or not privilege, it's just the substance of it doesn't make any sense to be about anything but basis for the hush money. Because if it did, don't you think the defense, the first thing that they would be doing would be entering evidence that this LL, you know, whatever the name of the LLC was, was actually established to buy, you know, 40 Wall Street or whatever. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm, I guess from a lay perspective, if Cohen was the lawyer for the Trump organization and he had a conversation with Alan Weisselberg about setting up the LLC, who owns the privilege to that conversation? You know, is Weisselberg going to say, I can't do that because, you know, that's a privileged conversation or I mean, I look, Cohen's going to talk about it. And I think Cohen recorded it, but there are presumably other conversations, similar conversations. Right. I mean, I guess what I'll say is that presumably the judge has already ruled that this tape can come in. So at that point, I mean, that's not privileged anymore, right? If, if it's a recorded conversation. Yeah. And the, the, yeah. So there's going to be, you know, there, uh, when we went back to the beginning of how this trial is going to go, it's preliminary motions. And then it's uh, motion, then it's, then it's, then it's jury selection, which, you know, on a, on the Trump cases, I mean, in a regular false filings case, it'd be a day and a half. It's not going to be a day and a half, spoiler alert. And then it goes to the trial itself. But even the trial itself, you know, in terms of like the just amount of evidence, this is not, I mean, this is not a six month trial. I, I don't think it's a six week trial. If it's only a six week trial, it could take that long to pick a jury. But the actual evidence, it's not that big. So it sounds like that's going to be, uh, you know, that, that that it will be more difficult than to seat a regular jury. But do you think that it will take more than, say, a week to to choose a jury? I can't imagine, because, I look, I've 
been on jury duty a bunch of times. It, nobody, you know, they ask you every time, who here hates cops? Or are you more likely to believe, you know, an officer or, uh, and, and nobody, well, there's always somebody who wants to get out of jury duty. And was like, I never, I believe all cops, they, you know, lie or whatever. Right. But it's, it's difficult to do that. Right. I, I mean, I don't, the Georgia case is going to take six months, and so people will do anything to get out of jury duty. But with this one being a relatively, you know, like a couple of weeks at most, I think, or maybe three, right. I, I mean, uh, wh why do you think it's going to take so long to do it? I mean, I don't think it's going to take six weeks, but I also don't think, I think, I would not be surprised if it took a week or more. Be, like mm -hmm. be, only because of who the defendant is, nobody's not heard of him. Um, mm -hmm. So there's going to be a lot of people, and and you know there might be a lot of people who just you know if they love him or hate him, right? Most people have an opinion. I mean, remember what you're looking for in jury selection is people that can be blank slates, and I mean especially the world we live in now, that's very very hard to find. So it's going to be so there's it's it's not the the. 10 peremptories is not a lot of, of challenges. If it were just the peremptories on each side, it would take two days at max. But because of like the pre-screening of who the defendant is and whether, you know, they hate him, don't hate him. Like they, I mean, even the fact that he's been found civilly responsible for sexual assault, there may, there might be a whole subset of people that wouldn't, you know, that, that can't be fair. will say, I can't mm -hmm. be fair because I was a, you know, a sexual assault victim or my family mm -hmm. member was. So that's why I think it could be, it could be more, it's not the jury selection itself. It's the selecting, it's getting the actual pool from which to choose. That's going to take a while. Interesting. Okay. Well, that is very exciting. And I hope you will come back and talk about that. But I know that you, uh, you have already agreed and I'm going to hold you to it to come back mm -hmm. and talk about what you do now, uh, now that you are not a prosecutor, because what you do now is sports law and you have indeed sued the NCAA successfully. Yes, yes. I um, brought the NCAA to uh, Bronx Supreme Court and, and we obtained a preliminary injunction of, on behalf of our uh, Manhattan College basketball player. That is amazing. All right. So I'm looking forward to you coming back and talking about NCAA law. And I, Diana, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. This was great. Law and Chaos Podcast is a production of Raise It to Media, LLC, is intended solely as entertainment, does not constitute legal advice, and does not form an attorney-client relationship. This show is researched and written by Liz Dye and produced by Bryce Blankenagle. Law and Chaos Pod, copyright 2024, Raise It to Media, LLC, all rights reserved.